Amen. Good morning, Woodland, and welcome today to our online service. I am so glad that you're with us, and I hope that you've already let us know that you're watching. If you haven't, why don't you just go on uh, right there on the bottom of your Facebook screen or YouTube, if you can do it on YouTube, and just say hi to everybody and uh, let us know that you're watching. As a matter of fact, why don't you just take just a moment and type in, if you, if you can, <clears throat> type in this morning, uh, what your favorite worship song is. I'd love to see just a list of all of those songs that come up that you enjoy singing and, and worshiping the Lord with. You know, when I'm by myself, I find myself singing a lot. And once my family begins to wake up, I find myself singing. And this morning, Becky came to me and she says, you need to be quiet. The windows are open and you're singing loud and all the neighbors can hear. And what was so funny was I was singing an old, old children's church song back from when I was a kid that I remembered. And then I started just making up songs and singing them. So let me know what your favorite worship song is, and let's, um, let's share with one another what those are. Also, if you haven't given yet, would you take just a moment and you can text to give at 77977, keyword Woodland Church. You know, Jesus talked about giving a lot. One of the things that Jesus said was if we sow generously, we would reap generously. But this morning in my Bible, I was, I was reading and I was just thinking about this verse of Scripture and I wanted to share it with you. I will sacrifice a voluntary offering to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good, for you have rescued me from my troubles. Let me read that again. I will sacrifice a voluntary offering. God loves a cheerful giver. We don't want anybody to give that feels manipulated or forced. You know, I'm fond of saying God loves a cheerful giver, but he'll accept from a grump. If you're grumpy, go ahead and give anyway, but give voluntarily. Nobody's forcing you, but praise his name. And one of the reasons that David says in this psalm I will give is you have rescued me from my troubles. I am so thankful that God has protected you. He's protected us from this COVID virus, protected us from this coronavirus, and for the people that are recovering. And it's just a wonderful way that we have in church when we worship together every week to say, Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. And let me pray for you for your giving right now. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege of giving. I thank you this morning that, God, I know the folks that I'm speaking to have the ability and have the gratitude and the joy with which to give. I thank you, Lord, for people who don't even worship at Woodland, who have been donating to help us, Lord, with our ministries in the community and around the world. And I thank you, too, Lord Jesus, for how good you have been to us, how you have provided for our needs. But most importantly this morning, you have saved us, Lord. And Jesus, by your death and your resurrection, we have found grace and mercy in the eyes of the Lord, and you have made us one with the Father. But additionally, Lord, I thank you for having protected us from this COVID virus. I thank you for especially touching my three-year-old grandson, Lord, and that, that he recovered from this COVID virus. I thank you for the goodness of God that is manifested in all of our lives. So this morning, as we go to your word, Lord, as Pastor Rick prayed just now, would you give us open ears? Open hearts, O oh Lord, and help us, O oh God, to serve you and to please you in everything we do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Well, thanks so much for joining me. Let me get my iPad on here, and while I'm doing that, I want to talk to you about God's love language this morning. You know, I read a book several years ago in that I have recommended often to the church <clears throat> and said to you that it's one of my favorite books. <clears throat> Pardon me. Matter of fact, I'll be rereading that book again this summer. It's by Gary Chapman and it's called The Five Love Languages. And basically, the idea is this that there are five ways that people love, express their love, and basically, five ways that people express their love. Now, all five of these ways, each of us, in some measure or another, we, we have them, but there's a primary way that each of us express love and give love. Through words of affirmation, where we say to someone, I love you, you did a great job on that, thank you for what you did, and you really did good with it. That's, those are words of affirmation. Then there are those that your primary love affection, uh, love language is physical affection. You love to be hugged, you love to be, to be greeted, you love the physical touch aspect. 
And then there are those of us that it comes through quality time, whether it's spending a, a lazy afternoon together, whether it's taking a day off and just getting away with the person that we love and spending the day with them. Maybe it's just an evening like we have every week with our family on Thursday nights, a family night, or maybe it's a vacation that you take together. And then there are some people, you really respond to personal gifts. You love gadgets, you love trinkets. If you're ladies, you love jewelry. I guess some guys love jewelry as well. But you, you love jewelry, but you love gifts. People, when they give you gifts, that makes you feel really loved and appreciated. And then there are some people that it's through acts of service. It's when you actually get out and you help them, you work alongside of them. Matter of fact, you do your best work when you're in partnership with somebody because <clears throat> it's just the way that you give and express love. And sometimes if your love language is physical touch, and let's say your wife's love language is acts of service, and you come in and she goes, you know, I needed your help today. Where were you? And what you were hoping to hear was, honey, I love you. Thank you for everything you do for our family. You don't feel loved or you don't feel understood. Or maybe if you're the person that you like acts of service and somebody comes in and says, I love you so much and it's hard for you to accept that they love you because you can never count on them to help you in the garden or to help you in the yard or to help you around the house or to help you at work. It's just... It's, if we understand those things, it helps us to get along a lot better with people. But I like to share with folks, God has a love language as well. And God's love language is one of giving. The devil takes, but God gives. <clears throat> and I know you know these verses with me. So I want you to read them along with me this morning, if you would. This is in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And here's my favorite part, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is so powerful. I want to read it again. So let's don't take the slide down off the screen yet. I want you to, to just let this sink into your being this morning. For God so loved, there's God's love language, that he gave, see it being, he's giving gifts, he's giving his son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. God doesn't want to condemn you. God wants to save you and give you eternal life, but that the world through him might be saved. You know, there's a prayer that many Christians pray, and Maybe we should pray this more often in our congregation here. It's not actually a part of, of our regular Sunday morning worship, but perhaps it should be. I found myself for several years praying this prayer often because it's such a good reminder for me. And it's called the Jesus Prayer. And it just simply goes, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let's say that together. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, if you grew up in a church like I did, you probably never heard that before. But if you grew up in a liturgical church, you probably have heard that before. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But let's say it one more time. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, you see, for me, the sting in, those, in that prayer is those last two words, a sinner. You know, God has not called me to tell the world they're sinners. God has called me to recognize that I'm a sinner. That's the story of my life. It's not a story that I failed. It's not a story that I haven't reached my self-actualization, as Abraham Maslow would have put it. It's not a story that I made mistakes. It's not a story that I've made errors in my judgment. It's not a story of whether I had good parentage or bad parentage. It's a story of who I am. I am a sinner saved by grace. One time I heard a, a preacher say, you're not a sinner, you're not a worm. Well, no, I'm not a worm, but I will tell you this, I am a sinner saved by grace. And that goes against everything in our counseling and therapeutic culture where nobody is responsible for anything. But friends, when we understand that we pray this prayer along with the saints throughout the ages, and I'm not talking about 
people that the, the Catholic Church has recognized as saints. I'm talking about you who are believers in Jesus Christ. The Bible refers to us as saints. The Bible just simply says that you and I are sinners saved by grace. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about sin. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> the Bible has a lot more to say about sin than you might think that it has to say. It has a lot to say about how widespread sin is. It has a lot to say about how damaging sin is. As a matter of fact, Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 3, for everyone has sinned. How many people in the world have sinned? Everybody. That includes me. That includes you. And we all fall short of God's glorious standard. So we see from this verse, sin is damaging to our life. Sin has Damage something that God did not intend to be a part of my life. Then the Bible goes on in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 to say, for the wages of sin, in other words, the results or the outcome of sin in our lives, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And you might be thinking for just a moment to yourself, seriously, pastor, sin is that damaging? Seriously, pastor, it's that widespread? Seriously? Sin has, has separated me from God? I thought we were all God's children. Seriously? Well, how serious should we take sin? Well, let's look at James chapter 4 and verse 8. Move your heart closer and closer to God, and He will come even closer to you. Isn't that a wonderful promise? I love the way the King James Version says it. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. But let's read the rest of the verse. But make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners, and keep your heart pure and stop doubting. Feel the pain of your sin. Be sorrowful and weep. And maybe you're thinking to yourself right now, really? Really? Seriously? Is sin that big a deal? Well, let's read the rest of the verse. Let your joking around be turned into mourning and your joy into deep humiliation. Be willing to be made low before the Lord, and He will exalt you. Wow. What a powerful passage of Scripture. Be willing to be made low, or be willing to humble yourself. That made low really is the word humble. Be willing to humble yourself before the Lord, and God will exalt you. You see, the key to blessings is always humility. The key to blessings is always obedience. The key to joy and fulfillment in life is, is trusting God. You know, I often tell you here at church, you don't have to fear the devil. I think these demon-possessed movies are dangerously silly. And I use, use that phrase explicitly. Number one, they're dangerous because people who don't know better, they get deceived by them. They're silly because I want you to know he that dwelleth in me is greater than he that's in the world. So we don't have to fear the devil. And I will just tell you something else. I don't watch those movies because I don't want my mind to be opened up and exposed to that kind of garbage. I'd rather just look at what the Bible says because I've walked in the truth and the power of that, dealing with people that have been tormented by the devil for many, many years now, many decades now, so that I, I've seen that firsthand. I don't need a silly movie made by somebody that doesn't really understand to tell me about that. So don't fear the devil, but the Bible is very, very clear on the fact that sin is cunning. Sin will confuse you. Sin will baffle you. I remember the first time that a theology professor told me when I was studying for the ministry that in the Bible, sin is a power at work in the world. That the Bible wants us to see sin, not just as the sins that we've committed, that I've committed, like greed or pride or something like that, or gossip. <clears throat> but the Bible wants me to see that sin is a power that is cunning, and it's terribly, terribly destructive to people. And it's terribly destructive to the world, the planet that we live in. Here are some words that the Bible uses for sin. The Bible describes sin, and pardon me again, <clears throat> the Bible describes sin as wandering off the path. In other words, you take a wrong turn, you're, and you end up in a place that you never meant to be. My good friend, Dwayne Jones, that was a missionary who's now in heaven with the Lord, Dwayne told me a story, and he shared it here at Woodland as well, where he said, sin will take you further than you ever thought you would go, Sin would take you places you never thought you would stay, 
And sin will keep you there longer than you ever dreamed you would be there. You see, sin is that wandering off the path. It's, the word is actually the missing of the mark. It's the picture of an archer. And you don't want to be standing by a target if the archer is not skilled. I mean, not everybody is a William Tell that can shoot an apple off his son's head, according to the lore of Switzerland. You know, a, a, an archer that misses the mark could end up killing you. Well, that's what a sin is. It's a wandering off the path. Sin is to be broken. Nobody wants a broken computer. Nobody wants a broken phone or a broken car. You know, if you get a broken window, you replace it. Sin also means blemished, and it's a true truism. I mean, students, listen to me, and I hope we've got students out there listening. I remember when I was dating. If I had a date, I'll guarantee you I was going to get a pimple on my face the night I had that date. It was a blemish on my face. And they used to advertise this stuff called Clericel because you could cover up those pimples with Clericel. And I went into Piggly Wiggly, bought a big tube of that stuff, and I tried to cover it up when I was in high school. It didn't work. You see, you couldn't bring to God a lamb that was blemished. You couldn't bring to God a, 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 a sacrifice that was blemished. Sin is also, it means to be crooked. I had my my grandmother's maiden name was Crook. So my great-grandparents that I remember, we called them Grandfather Crook and Grandmother Crook. And we used to laugh about that when we would get the car. And, and my granny, my grandmother, my mother's mother, she didn't like that at all because we would tease about we were related to a bunch of crooks. Well, sin is crooked. Sin is rebellion. Sin, that's another word that the Bible used to describe sin is rebellion. Uh, I remember listening to Robert Spence, the president of Evangel University, talk about his son John one time. And he said in this message that he was preaching that when John was a little boy that John had misbehaved and had said some things he shouldn't have said. And, 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 and uh, Pastor Spence looked at him and says, John, sit down right now. John just kind of looked at him defiantly. He says, John, I said, sit down right now. John sat down and he looked up at his daddy and he says, I'm sitting down on the inside, but I'm standing, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. You see, sin is that rebellious nature in all of us. Sin is owing a debt. Sin always costs somebody something. Sin costs God his son so that you and I could be saved. But when you sin against someone, you owe them a debt. If you gossip about them, you've, you've trespassed against their name. If you defraud someone, you know, you just go through the list of sins. You have sinned against someone. You owe them a debt. And sin makes us a debtor to other people. And that's the reason it's so important that we understand in our world where everything is okay as long as two adults are consenting. Friends, not only do those consenting adults have a sin to pay, but the people around them that are affected by their sin, there's a debt to that. The Bible describes sin as lawlessness. It's a lawless power. And rebellion is as the sin is witchcraft. And then it's the sin of trespass as well. You know, trespassing is when you come on somebody's property and you're not supposed to be there. <clears throat> and, in my, and in my profession, now you need to understand, as a pastor, and I don't use that word profession often, but just so you can understand whatever job you're in, in my profession as a pastor, it would be real easy for me to rationalize trespassing because there are so many things that I'm called upon to do sometimes that I have to say no to because to do those things would be trespassing or putting myself or someone else in a position of that could be potential compromise that I never want to do to, to this church, to my family, to myself, and especially to Christ. And I don't want to do that to them as well. It reminds me of the story, and I've shared this several times before, but a minister was running late for an appointment, and he circled the city block about 10 times, and finally he pulled into a, 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 a no-parking zone. He says, I'm running late for an appointment. I, I have to be there on time. Please forgive me of my trespasses. Well, when he got back to his car, there was a ticket on the car, and on the bottom of the ticket, the police officer had written, I've been circling this block for 10 years, and if I don't write you a ticket, I'll lose my job. Lead us not into temptation. You see, it's easy to trespass and ask people to do things that will compromise them and compromise us as well. 
And then another word that the Bible uses is the sin of impurity, is the word impurity, when something is impure. And that can be a difficult word to understand. I mean, we think we understand purity, but I want to talk to you for just a moment about that. Let me show you two verses from the Bible, and we're going to read them one right after the other. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 22, the Bible says, do not share in the sins of others. So like the, like the police officer, I don't want to invite somebody to share in my sin by ignoring it. I, I want to deal with sin. But the Bible goes on and where Paul writes to young Pastor Timothy, and he says, keep yourself pure. And then remember the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who said in Matthew 5 and verse 8, God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Let's read it again. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. And I think that's something that we all want. All of us want to see God. All of us want to know God. But you see, the confusion comes when we start thinking about the word purity. You see, in the Bible, the word pure means things are like they should be. That beautiful Hebrew, Hebrew word, shalom, that's the peace of God, the wholeness of God, the blessing of God, the health of God, the prosperity of God, every good thing that God wants to give to you and I. That's where we get our idea of purity from. Impurity means when things are not like they're supposed to be. So if things are not in my marriage or in my home or in my heart the way they should be, it's impure. But now, here's the conf confusing thing is, is sometimes the standard for, for purity is a bit confusing. You know, take, for instance, our FDA. They are tasked with the responsibility of being sure that our food is pure. But the FDA's idea of purity and my idea of purity, well, those are two different things. It's really concerning to me. For instance, this is according to the FDA, and I love apple butter. So if you're ever traveling and you think, I want to bring a gift to pastor, you know, I love good coffee and I love apple butter. But look at this. Apple butter is pure if it averages four more rotted hairs per 100 grams, five or more insects, not counting mice or aphids, which are okay with the government if that's in our apple butter. So next time you put your apple butter on your biscuit and your butter, just remember you got a little mouse in there, you got some aphid in there. You probably want me to stop, but I think you get the idea that apple butter, according to the FDA, it's pure if it's not pure. Let's take mushrooms. And oh, don't you love good mushrooms, especially sauteed and served over a steak? Well, you're going to want to saute them after I read them this to you because mushrooms are only considered impure if they have 20 maggots. If they have 19 maggots, they're pure. So enjoy those mushrooms on your steaks tomorrow as you celebrate Memorial Day. And you know, by the way, in those mushrooms, other parts of insects are okay. It's still considered pure. So maggots and insects, according to the FDA, that's pure. I got to tell you, the FDA standard alarms me a little bit, and it's not healthy for me to read that because I find myself wanting to grow everything myself and be sure it's pure. But what I'm trying to illustrate to you is, is this shows us that things are not the way they're supposed to be. If it's true of apple butter, if it's true of mushrooms, then how much more true is it of my heart? And how much more true is it of your heart? You see, my heart is supposed to be a place of love. My heart is supposed to be a place of justice. My heart is supposed to be a place of character and compassion. So when I see injustice being done, it should grieve me and anger me. My heart should be a heart of compassion. So when I see people suffering, I want to, have, I want to help them. Simply is, sin is simply the destruction of that. Sin destroys my love. It destroys the sense of justice in my life. It destroys the sense of character in my life. It destroys love in my heart. Sin not only destroys my life, but sin affects the world I live in, the people I live with, but it affects and affects the whole ecosystem that we live in. So much of what's wrong in our planet is a result of sin because sin, the power of sin, it deadens, it degrades, 
and it enslaves. You might want to write those three things down. The power of sin, it deadens, it degrades, and it enslaves. And if you can remember those three words, it will help you. So what I need is not to be, have my sins pointed out. What you need is not to have your sins pointed out. And what we need is not what so many Christians ask is, how much sin can I get by with? I need power f- to be free from sin. I need freedom from sin. One of my professors, and when I, again, when I was studying for the ministry, his name was Robert Elliott. And oh, I, we called him Brother Elliott. I loved Brother Elliott. And one of my really, really high points of honor was just before I moved up to Michigan, he called me and asked me to come uh, preach a, a, a crusade in the city of Miami, Florida with immigrants and people living on the streets. And, and it wasn't anything like a Billy Graham crusade, but we gathered these immigrants and we gathered all of these people and we ministered and we fed and we clothed. And it was such a wonderful place. And you'd say, oh, it was wonderful because it was Miami. It was wonderful because I ministered alongside of one of my heroes of the faith, touching, loving people. We used to try and tell, call him sometimes Weeping Bob because Brother Elliot would just teach and when he would talk about the love of God and the grace of Jesus, his eyes would just flow with tears. And I watched him that day kneeling down with winos and drug addicts and prostitutes, loving them and embracing them, people living in boxes and bringing food, helping them to find resources, and we shared the good news of Jesus Christ with them every single day. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been in my life because of the grace of God that was being exhibited. But I will never forget that he taught us as young ministerial students when he said to us one day, he said, don't live your life trying to think about how much of the world can I live in and still be close to the cross? How much sin can I have in my life and still be saved? Determined to live your life at the foot of the cross. Determined to live your life close to Jesus. Determined to live your life free from the power of sin. And you see, sometimes I think people and the church and the church itself can get a little weird about this because we want to point out the sins of everybody else. The message of the Bible is not about our being punished for our sin. The message of the Bible is about how Jesus came to save us from our sin. The message of the Bible is how Jesus came to give us power over sin. The message of the Bible is how Jesus came to deliver our sin, deliver us from our sin. The problem with sin is not that I'm going to get in trouble with God. The problem with sin is not that I'm going to get in trouble with somebody else. The problem with sin is at its core it's, it's, it's demeaning my life, it's degrading my life, it's enslaving my life. The problem of sin is it's destroying me. So what sin should I hate? The sin that I should hate should be my own sin. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. Love must be sincere. Family, I could work my whole life on that and still never get it just right. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Nowhere that Paul is saying that we're to hate sin in somebody else's life, he's saying, I hate the sin in my life. I hate the greed in my life. I hate the coldness in my life. I hate the condemnation in my life. I hate anything that keeps me away from the foot of the cross. Paul said, if I'm going to boast about anything, I'm going to boast about the, co- the power of the cross. You see, as a pastor, and I hope you will hear this from the heart that I mean it with this morning, I've watched too many marriages end up cold. I've watched too many marriages end up in divorce because of sin. I've watched too many children hurt because of the coldness of sin. I've watched too many teenagers, their lives get ruined because their bodies made promises that their wills could not keep. And the the child that comes as a result of that or the child that is destroyed in an abortion because of that. I've watched adults get compromised by sin and give up their families and then end up on the ash heap and end up unhappy. I've watched families torn apart by sin. I've witnessed our nation being torn apart right now by the sins of division and the sins of sectarianism and the sins of racism. 
we see it happening and we see people that are supposed to be bringing us together, pulling us apart and pulling us into diverse groups and interest groups rather than bringing us together is what we're supposed to be. When the one thing that would heal America, that would heal the church, that would heal a marriage, that would heal a family, that will heal me, is to humble myself before God and confess my sins, not your sins, but confess my sins, and say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. And James says, and then God will lift you up. Oh, friends, I'm just asking you this weekend, on this Memorial Day weekend, when we remember those who paid the ultimate price to preserve and to protect our freedoms, those who paid the ultimate price so that you and I could enjoy a barbecue tomorrow, so that you and I could, could enjoy worshiping together freely the way we are this morning, I'm asking us, will we as a body of Christ take time to thoughtfully Humble ourselves before the Lord today and just simply pray, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. And if you've sinned against somebody, if you've wronged that person, go to them and confess it. And if you can, make it right. If you need somebody to encourage you or to help you with accountability, let us know here at the church. We'll put you together with an encouragement partner or let your small group know Friends, you will never, never, never find a greater relief. Now listen, even if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ and you're listening today, you will never find a greater relief and you will never find greater joy than the moment you confess your sins to Christ and you trust Jesus to forgive you and to cleanse you and to lift that load and to take that power out of your life that is destroying you. But Jesus also told a parable to self-righteous people that didn't want to confess their sins. Let's look at Luke chapter 18 and verse 9 this morning. Jesus also told this parable to some who were confident they were righteous and they looked down on everyone else. He told a story about a, a, a sinner who was kneeling and praying, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, a sinner. That's where we get that prayer. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then there was this self-righteous Pharisee that looked down at him, and he says, Lord, I thank you I'm not like this guy. I thank you I'm not like this sinner. I tithe. I go to church. He goes through all the good things. It's like he's doing God a favor. He's not like this sinner. And Jesus looked at everybody and says, who do you think walked away with their prayer answered? It certainly wasn't that self-righteous Pharisee. It's not that self-righteous Christian. It's not that self-righteous preacher. It's not that self-righteous judge of other people. It's that humble person that humbles himself before the Lord, and God lifts them up. For the Bible says, Jesus says in Luke 18 and verse 14, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself would be exalted. Look at somebody in your family right now and say, come on, victory. That's a whole new meaning to what humility is. So what I want to tell you is this. Jesus, well, let me tell you a little story. I, I have a friend. He ministers in the inner city of one of our major cities. We were worked in youth ministry together down in Georgia, and he moved to the inner city, and he got this old beat-up, dilapidated car, and I went to see him and spent some time with him, and I looked at and he loved cars, and I said, what is this? He goes, this is my chick magnet. I said, you're what? He goes, oh, yeah. He said, when I drive this around, I get all kinds of looks, and and we had a big laugh, and the reason he bought the car is so it wouldn't be stolen when he was working in the inner city. But here's what I want you to know. Jesus is a sinner magnet. He draws people like me to himself. He draws people like me who don't have a hope or a chance to be able to make it in heaven. I wouldn't have an ice cube's chance in hell to make it into heaven if it wasn't for Jesus. And I am so drawn to Jesus. You see... I want to become a friend of Jesus because Jesus is a friend of lost people. Look at this, Matthew eleven nine. 9. Jesus is the friend, and I put my name in there. Jesus is the friend of Dennis, a sinner. Jesus is your friend no matter who you are. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and the apostle Paul says, I am the worst of them all. Oh, my beloved friends, please understand this this morning. 
It's where we get this, this prayer. Jesus is my friend. He's your friend. He's come to save us. And that beautiful, beautiful book, To Kill a Mockingbird, Atticus Finch is a moral man. He's a hero. He's one of the great heroes of literature, in my opinion. And his, he said to his daughter one time, he said, remember, it's a sin to kill a mockingbird, an innocent little creature that just wants to bring beauty into the world. She says, it was the only time I heard my father use the word sin. You see, Finch battled injustice. He was a compassionate man. He was a loving man. But he didn't go around condemning people and calling them sinners. You see, he's kind of like Jesus. Jesus never called anyone a sinner. He saved his worst, harshest words for people like me that are preachers and teachers of the Bible. So it tells me I want to see people as God sees them. I want to see them as beloved. I want to see them as cared for. I want to see them as people that Jesus died for, whether they're my friend or whether they're my enemy. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by an outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Jesus said in John 7 and verse 24, stop judging by outward appearance. Instead, judge correctly. And then the next thing I want to be, I, I want to love everyone. I want to love every single one. Let's look at this verse. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, in the Bible, your neighbor is everyone. It's not just my good friends, my neighbors that live next door to me, but it's everyone. Uh, look at this verse, Matthew 5, verse 44. This is not going to let you off the hook. Jesus said, I said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. You see, I, I want to learn to grow to be more and more like Jesus, my Savior, and learn to love everybody. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 in humility, think more of each other than you do of yourselves. None of you, none of you, me included, should think only of his own affairs, but he should learn to see things from other people's point of view. Here's something I've learned, even from my enemies, and I want you to get this, and this is so important. Everybody has different backgrounds. Everybody has different love languages. Everybody, some people were raised by, raised by abusive parents. Some people were raised by absent parents. Some people were raised by critical parents. Some people were raised by condemning parents. Some people were raised in orphanages, like my father-in-law. Some people were raised in, in an environment in the inner city where their mother came home with, with, with paying customers every single night, and men would come in and out the door. That's all they knew. Mary was a, a friend of mine. Mary was a lost friend of mine that came to know Jesus. But the only life she'd ever known was when she was three years old, her mother began to pimp her out on the streets. Mary began weeping one day when I told her how much God loved her. And through her tears, Mary looked at me and she said, nobody's ever told me that before. Everybody's told me I'm going to hell. Everybody's told me how bad I am. And she looked at me and she called me by my name. She says, Dennis, nobody has ever told me that God loved me. And Mary became a born-again Christian. God did a marvelous, marvelous change in her life. Friends, it makes me question, have I really valued the praying parents am I, that I have? Have I valued the praying friends and relatives that I have? Those of us that grew up with good parents and wonderful homes, are we appreciating the heritage that we grew up with? Are we appreciating the gift of life that we've given? And let's don't look down on other people, especially if we grew up in loving families and we grew up in churches that loved us and taught us the Word of God. So how do we do this? Number one, I'd say listen. Become a good listener. Focus on learning how to listen and listen well. The Bible says, listen before you answer. And if you don't, honey, I hope you're listening to this because I know you don't like this word. If you don't, you're being stupid and insulting. Now, I didn't say that. The Bible said that. So I don't want to get in trouble when I get home. Everybody knows my wife. Knows that she doesn't like anyone to be called stupid or to use that word. Listen before you answer. If you don't, you're being stupid and insulting. And there's an art to listening. Look people in the eyes. Stop talking. Don't think about what you want to say to them, but listen carefully to them and, and, and take note of what they're saying. 
Look at how they're sitting. Look at their body language, but learn to listen carefully. Number two, love like Jesus loved. I mean, how did Jesus love? Well, the Bible is so clear that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, he took our sins to the cross. Jesus didn't grumble on his way to Calvary. Jesus didn't grumble about coming to save us. He suffered for us greatly. We, we talked about that Good Friday, but Jesus never grumbled or complained, and he never said, look how much I've done for you. He just simply loved you, and I want to learn to love like Jesus, and I confess there are times I want people to know how hard I've worked for them. I'm, I, I confess there are times I want my family, my children to know, you know, what their mom and I have done for them, but that's not the Jesus way. To learn to love like Jesus is just simply to show people they matter. So I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Circle that word. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love, circle that word again, for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. People know when they're loved and people know when they're condemned. So love people. And then finally, love God's family. Love the church. Be a part of a church. Be, you know, join with us right here online and worship with us every Sunday. I can't wait till we get back in these facilities. And I am so thankful for what the president said this week. Yes, the churches are essential. Praise God for that. I appreciate the president saying that. But friends, we already knew that. We already knew that the church was essential. And we can't wait to be back here gathered to worship with one another I love the family of God. I love the body of Christ, but this building is not the church. And I said in a meeting that I was a part of this week, you know, the building has, the not being able to be in the building has not stopped us from being the church. We are the body of Christ. And you have expressed your love in this community so well to others. As a matter of fact, one of our, uh, one of our officials from the, the township came to me this week and says, I am so proud and so thankful for the way that you as a church have just stepped up and served in the community and the love of Jesus that you brought off there. I'm grateful to you for that. But I'm saying to those of you that may be distant or maybe you've been hurt in times past, there's a church and there are people that love God and they will love you. But love the body of Christ. We're not perfect, but we love Jesus and we will love you. Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some of us are slaves, some of us are free, but we've all been baptized in one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit, and read this out loud together with me as a church family. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. You matter. You belong to me. We belong to each other. And I need you. I I want you to know that I need you, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret. You need me. We need one another in the body of Christ. So love God's family, the church. And friends, I promise you, if we will love like Jesus, if we will look to our own hearts rather than trying to judge other people's hearts, then we will get the smile of God. I want God's smile upon my life. You know what? If you're able... Would you stand with me right now in your family room along with your children? Guys that are in here with me, would you stand as well? I want to read this verse of Scripture, and I want you to read it out loud as a family because this is a blessing I want to pray over us. May God be merciful and bless us, and may His face smile with favor upon us. And that word interlude means to think about it. So if you're with your family, just take their hands or with your husband or wife, take his hand, her hand, and I want you to agree with me right now. Father God, thank you. Thank you for how much you have loved us. Thank you for your love language of having given your son to save us, not to condemn us. Thank you that you understand us better than we understand ourselves. You know our backgrounds. You know our heritage. You you know what we have been taught, what we haven't been taught. And Lord, none of us are better than the other. We're all sinners in need of the grace of God. And so I come to you this morning, and if there are those out there that think they're not good enough, if there are those who think I need to clean my life up first, if there are those out there that think I'm not sure, and Lord, right now there's a sense they want to pray this prayer, they want to give their life to Jesus then I just ask them, Lord, give them the faith to pray with me. 
And our prayer this morning is going to be very simple. Just say it with me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Pray it one more time. Not because the first time wasn't good enough, but I want it in your heart and mind. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Father, I thank you for those who prayed that prayer in faith believing you today. I thank you that those who prayed that prayer that even right now the scriptures tell us that all of heaven is rejoicing. I'm rejoicing, Lord, and I pray that you would help them. Lord, they have committed their life as much as they know how. They have committed their life to you by saying, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I pray that you will bless them, smile upon them, and smile upon each of us today. For it's in Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Now don't log off. Don't log off. I want you to, I want you to listen. I want to help you. If you prayed that prayer, would you please let me know? Let us know on Facebook or YouTube. If you want to be anonymous, please send me an email. All you got to do is just send me an email to pastor at woodland.church. That's it. It'll come straight to me. Pastor at woodland.church. Or you can send it to our church, office at woodland.church. Last week, somebody sent us uh, an email, and we were able to put them a Bible and some other material in the mail. I promise you, we can't tomorrow because it's Memorial Day, but first thing Tuesday morning, we will send it out to you. But I want to be sure that you get this Bible in your hands that will help you learn. There's all kinds of studies, helps in there, how to know God, how to walk with God, how to read the Bible, how to share your story, help you understand what you've just done. I'll be happy to communicate with you if you communicate with me. I'm more than happy to do that. But please let us know because we're here to help you and to serve you. And one more time, family, let's just give God thanks for those that I'm just by faith that have given their hearts to Jesus. And would you just thank him with your, your children, one another, as when you get ready to log off in a moment. And as well, if you don't mind, be sure and go online to www.woodland.church. Click the, the word give and you can give online there. Help us at our ministry and all that we're doing. Or you can text 77977. Use the keyword Woodland Church. And I am so grateful for everything you're doing. Now this week, I want you to look for a letter from me in the email. I'm going to be sending you out a plan for our grand relaunching of our public services as we get ready for people to come back and worship with us here at Woodland. So you look for that in your mail later this week. And I'll also send it out email and we'll send it out good old fashioned U.S. mail as well. I love you. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to smile upon you. Happy Memorial Day.